What's up everybody? In this video, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know about the heme synthesis pathway and all associated diseases. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. Dirty, I love what you do on this channel. How can I give back? Well, thank you for asking. If you're looking for a way to support my channel financially, you can click the join button. That join button is found underneath every single video, and it's also the first link in the description of any video on my channel. When you click that join link, you'll sign up to be a Dirty Medicine member, which means that you'll pay $4.99 a month in financial support of my channel in exchange for a few cool perks. I really appreciate your consideration, so if you want to give back, that's the way to do it. Now let's get into today's video. This video is about heme synthesis. And there's a lot of confusion and a lot of anxiety when it comes to learning the heme synthesis pathway. Because unlike other pathways in biochemistry, the heme synthesis pathway has the pathway itself. So of course you need to know things like products, reactants, enzymes. But then you also need to know at what point in the pathway certain diseases will manifest if there's a problem with a particular enzyme. To make matters even more complex, a lot of these diseases have a lot of overlapping features. The words sound the same, and a lot of medical students just have nightmares when it comes to this topic. So my goal in this video is to first go through the pathway as we normally would, as if we were approaching this like a biochemistry pathway. I'll point out what you need to know, and then I'm going to simplify and reduce everything using some helpful mnemonics and pointing some things out to you so that you're able to conceptualize this and answer 100% of your questions with ease. So with that said, let's get started. Before we go anywhere, I wanna point out that when we talk about the heme synthesis pathway, part of the pathway occurs in the mitochondria, so that'll be the left part of this slide, and part of the pathway is occurring in the cytosol, so that'll be on the right part of this slide. Now where we begin is with the two reactants, glycine plus succinyl-CoA. And these reactants will go to the product aminolevulinic acid, also known as ALA. The enzyme that does this reaction is actually our rate-limiting enzyme. That's ALA synthase. So right off the bat, the first step of the pathway is the rate-limiting enzyme, which makes it a little bit easier to memorize because you don't have to worry about an enzyme that's like halfway down. So glycine plus succinyl-CoA going to ALA by ALA synthase. This should be somewhat easy to remember because ALA synthase is synthasing or synthesizing aminolevulinic acid. And you can see here that vitamin B6, shown in blue, is a cofactor. So this is a very important step and probably the highest yield step in the whole pathway. So the first step is our rate limiting step. Now it's aminolevulinic acid that actually leaves the mitochondria and enters the cytosol. And the conversion of ALA into something called porphobilinogen is done by ALA dehydratase. So ALA leaves the mitochondria and then in the cytosol gets converted to porphobilinogen. Porphobilinogen will, that get, will then get converted to hydroxymethylbilane and that's done by porphobilinogen deaminase. And then hydroxymethylbilane will be converted to uroporphyrinogen 3. And I don't care that you know this step. It's not really important, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Uroporphyrinogen 3 gets converted into coproporphyrinogen 3. And the enzyme that does that conversion is uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. Now, at this point, the coproporphyrinogen 3 will travel back into the mitochondria. So we've been in the cytosol for the past three or four steps. Now we're going back into the mitochondria. And the coproporphyrinogen 3 will get converted to protoporphyrin. And again, I don't care that you know that step because you don't need to know the enzyme. Again, I'll explain why in a little bit. And then once we're back in the mitochondria, the protoporphyrin gets converted by ferrochelatase into heme using iron as a cofactor. Okay, so these are all of the steps of the pathway. This is the entire pathway from start to finish. The first step is in the mitochondria, then ALA leaves the mitochondria. We have a couple more steps getting to coproporphyrinogen 3, and then coproporphyrinogen 3 goes back into the mitochondria. There it gets converted to protoporphyrin, and then that goes to heme, and that's how we make heme, hence the name heme synthesis pathway. Now, the first thing that I want to point out that's very important to understand for USMLE and COMLEX 
is that you need to know what steps occur in the mitochondria and what steps occur in the cytosol. And I think that the easiest way to memorize that is to simply memorize the two parts where there is the leaving or entering of one or the other. So what I'm talking about is that aminolevulinic acid that leaves the mitochondria and goes into the cytosol. So you would know if you were somehow able to memorize that, that the next several steps are in the cytosol and then coproporphyrinogen goes back into the mitochondria. So if you were able to memorize that, then you would know that everything that came after that was happening back in the mitochondria. So what I'm saying here is that we need a mnemonic to memorize those two steps because those two steps are the transition points in this pathway. And the way that I memorize this is that I, for ALA, I say I'm going a la cytosol. So that means to the, you know, in a lot of, uh, in like Spanish, I'm going a la cytosol. And then for coproperforinogen, I say caught me some mitochondria, which reminds me that it's the, uh, the reactant that starts with cop that goes back into the mitochondria. So cop me some mitochondria, cop for coproporphyrinogen, that's going back into the mitochondria. And ALA is going a la, ALA for a la, it's going a la cytosol. And that's how you know that it leaves the mitochondria and goes to the cytosol. So if you're able to memorize that using those mnemonics, then you really should understand where everything else in this pathway is occurring. So here's where we are so far, and what you need to do at this point is to simply understand the order of the pathway. Because after all, it's probably not worth memorizing those two mnemonics that I just gave you if you don't know what comes after ALA and you don't know what comes after copperol porphyrinogen. So what I'd like to do is highlight the first letter of all of the reactants here. I'm highlighting them in green, as you can see on this slide. And then what I'll do is if I can sort of just pull these off the slide and put them in order going down, we have glycine, succinyl-CoA, aminolevulinic acid, porphobilinogen, hydroxymethylbilane, uroporphyrinogen-3, coproporphyrinogen-3, protoporphyrin, and then heme. So this is the order of the pathway, G-S-A-P-H-U-C-P-H. And my mnemonic to remember the order of this pathway is that you can get some additional points having understood the correct pathway for heme. Boom, easy peasy, and it tells you exactly what pathway we're talking about because it ends with heme. So you can get some additional points having understood the correct pathway for heme. So that's your mnemonic to pair up with these reactants so that you understand the order. And then remember the, uh, the other mnemonic going a la cytosol and caught me some mitochondria so that you know where the transition points are. So at this point in the video, you understand the pathway. You know all of the enzymes and we'll come back to the enzymes in just a second. You know the order of how the pathway proceeds because of that super awesome mnemonic. And you know the transition points in this pathway going a la cytosol. So a la leaves the mitochondria, goes to the cytosol. And then you know cop me some mitochondria. So the reactant that starts with cop is the one that's going back into the mitochondria from the cytosol. So a couple really high yield things are you understand already right off the bat. The second part of this video and probably the higher yield part of this video is to understand at what point in this pathway will you get the manifestation of disease if one of these enzymes doesn't work? So if you if I pause for a second you, and go back to the statement I made a few minutes ago, I told you that there are a couple steps here uh, that I don't care if you know the enzymes for. And what I'm talking about is the ones where you don't see enzymes listed. So going from hydroxymethylbilane to uroporphyrinogen 3 and going from coproporphyrinogen 3 to protoporphyrin, you don't need to know those enzymes because there's no disease that happens when those enzymes don't work. The really high yield diseases are what you get when some of the enzymes that you see on this slide don't work. So there are five enzymes that you see here, ALA synthase, which is our rate limiting enzyme, ALA dehydratase, porphobilinogen deaminase, uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, and ferrochelatase. And at each of these enzymes, if you have a dysfunction or a deficiency of these enzymes, you get certain diseases. And what's obviously really high yield for USMLE and COMLEX is to know what those diseases are 
and to know what those diseases look like. So when you see the associations in the clinical vignette, you see the buzzwords, you see the labs, you see the hints, and you see some high yield images, you know what disease they're talking about, and then you could pick the correct enzyme. So like a really classic question would describe for you one of the diseases and then ask you which of the following enzymes is dysfunctional. And you'd have to pick either ALA synthase, ALA dehydratase, etc. So let's go through these one at a time and talk about the different diseases that you get when these enzymes don't work. So we'll just go in order. So the first one is when ALA synthase is dysfunctional, you get sideroblastic anemia. So the cause can either be due to a congenital cause, and that's an X-linked deficiency of ALA synthase, but you can also get an acquired cause, which either can be due to B6 deficiency, since B6 is a cofactor, alcoholism, or lead poisoning. And the really high yield association here is to know that isoniazid can cause B6 deficiency. So if someone's taking isoniazid, they can become deficient in B6, which means they don't have the cofactor required for the enzyme ALA synthase to work, and therefore functionally, it's as if ALA synthase itself is absent, and that would cause sideroblastic anemia. Now, as far as the buzzwords or the clinical associations that you want to look for are concerned, you want to look for images of ringed sideroblasts, and what you can see here is an example of a ringed sideroblast. And the reason that you get ringed sideroblasts in sideroblastic anemia is that basically sideroblastic anemia is due to a problem where iron cannot be incorporated into heme. So if we go back to our pathway here, technically ALA synthase deficiency gives you sideroblastic anemia, but even steps that occur after this first step can still give rise to sideroblastic anemia. Because if you can never get protoporphyrin converted into heme, and in that step you sort of strap or attach the iron onto the protoporphyrin, to make the heme, you get some symptoms of sideroblastic anemia. And the reason why you get a ringed sideroblast is because if you're not able to attach that iron to the protoporphyrin to make heme, then that iron is just sitting in the mitochondria. And when iron is just sitting in the mitochondria, you see this in the cell. So around the cell, or in the cell rather, you see iron that's just trapped in the mitochondria and that stains that kind of light blue color. So that's the iron that's just sitting there and the reason that it's sitting there is again, because of this ALA synthase deficiency and therefore because way downstream of that first step, you can never make heme, iron can't be attached in the step that goes from protoporphyrin to heme and therefore it's just chilling in the mitochondria. So sideroblastic anemia, bottom line, Congenital due to X-linked ALA synthase deficiency, acquired because of the lack of that B6 cofactor, which will usually be due to isoniazid. The image will either show you a ringed sideroblast where there's iron trapped in the mitochondria, or they'll describe it to you. As far as labs go, because you've got iron sitting in the mitochondria, the labs are going to resemble an iron overloaded state. So you'll see an increased ferritin, a decreased or normal TIBC, and increased iron. Treatment here is pyridoxine. Now the question is, how do you remember, or how do you memorize that sideroblastic anemia is due to an ALA synthase deficiency? And the way that I remembered this is that the, uh, the initials for sideroblastic anemia are SA, and SA backwards is AS, so ALA synthase. So SA, AS, SA for ALA synthase. Kind of easy. So that's the first one. That's the first disease you get if one of these enzymes don't work. Now, the next disease you actually get if two different enzymes don't work. So for both ALA dehydratase and ferroquelatase, if those enzymes don't work, you get lead poisoning. So the cause of lead poisoning is due to each of these enzymes not working, or one of these enzymes not working. But the question is, what is it that makes these enzymes not work? And usually that's an environmental exposure. So in children, that's going to be exposure to lead paint. And in adults, it's gonna be an environmental exposure, usually where the adult is working. So look for things like batteries, ammunition, or water in old lead pipes, okay? Now the big association for lead poisoning is gonna be an image, and that's gonna be an image of basophilic stippling. And when you, you look on this slide, you can see what basophilic stippling looks like. And these are like little teeny granules in the cell that 
is due to some products, some residual products of RNA, ribosomes, mitochondria, and citerosomes. And they get clumped up in these little clusters and they just sit in the cytoplasm due to the toxic effect of lead poisoning. The other associations, there's two more that you need to look for. So not only basophilic stippling, but also these things called lead lines. So if you're answering a question that kind of feels like it's about a heme synthesis pathway, and then they show you an x-ray, specifically they show you a long bone, and you see these little lines. I know that medical students, like generally speaking, don't know how to read x-rays. But if you see these lines on long bones, these are called lead lines. They're right, right in the metaphysial region. And this is due to lead deposition in the zone of calcification of the bone. So this is a really classic sign of lead poisoning. The last one is called a Burton line. A Burton line is just this blue-black discoloration along the base of the gums. So if you see an image of teeth, you see an x-ray, or you see a cell, those are all linked or associated with lead poisoning. So think lead poisoning. Now again, the question is how do you memorize that lead poisoning is a problem with ferrochelatase and ALA dehydratase? And my mnemonic is to write those two enzymes out, and instead of ferrochelatase, I say lyrochelatase, and then the first two letters of each of these makes lead. L-E in lyrochelatase, and the A and the D from ALA dehydratase. L-E-A-D for lead poisoning. So here's where we are. We know that sideroblastic anemia is due to ALA synthase deficiency because S-A is A-S backwards, and we know that lead poisoning, L-E-A-D, for lyrochelatase, which of course is ferrochelatase, and AD for ALA dehydratase. So it's not as complex or not as confusing as a lot of these review sources would make this seem. Now let's talk about our next disease. So if porpho, excuse me, porphobilinogen deaminase is dysfunctional, you get acute intermittent porphyria. So in this disease, really the association is all you need to know. This is the one that they say are the five Ps, which is kind of an overstated uh, mnemonic here, but the five Ps stands for pain in the abdomen, polyneuropathy, port wine colored urine, P450 inducers, and psychological symptoms. Really the big thing here is you're gonna get a test question on USMLE or Comlex. They're going to describe somebody with GI pain. Of course, at first glance, your brain is gonna go to the GI section and start to think of all that stuff, but they're gonna connect it to the heme synthesis pathway by giving you these weird symptoms. So it's gonna be like neuro neuropathy, GI pain, maybe it'll be some neuropsychiatric symptoms. And then they're gonna ask you either for the enzyme, which of course would be porphobilinogen deaminase, the buildup, or they're gonna ask you what caused this. And the high yield one that I really want you to know are the P450 inducing medications. So a couple of the big ones are phenytoin, barbiturates, and sulfonamides. But basically what's happening here is when somebody takes one of these medications, not only does it induce the CYP450 enzyme, but it induces ALA synthase as well. And if we go back to our pathway here, I'm sure you can appreciate that if ALA synthase gets induced, which means it kind of shows up and starts acting, and it tries to send this pathway forward, but somebody has acute intermittent porphyria, and therefore porphobilinogen deaminase does not work, you're basically creating a buildup of porphobilinogen that can't get converted to hydroxymethylbilane. And in acute intermittent porphyria, the reason that somebody gets GI pain, polyneuropathy, neuropsychiatric symptoms is because porphobilinogen is very neurotoxic. So it irritates somebody's stomach, it irritates somebody's brain, etc. So if you give somebody a medication that induces ALA synthase and tries to turn on this pathway, that makes acute intermittent porphyria worse. So bottom line here is when you get a question on USMLE or Comlex and they talk about one of those P450 inducing medications, at first glance, it might seem like a pharmacological question, something about mechanisms, side effects, but really what the test writer might go after is acute intermittent porphyria. So again, just like all of our other examples here, the big question is how do you remember that acute intermittent porphyria is linked to the dysfunction of porphobilinogen deaminase? And the way that I encourage you to remember this, my mnemonic is that AIP instead of AIP for acute intermittent porphyria, 
I say AIPD. And the PD stands for porphobilinogen deaminase. So acute intermittent porphyria, AIPD, PD for porphobilinogen deaminase. Now we've only got one enzyme left and that's uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. And if that enzyme is dysfunctional, you get porphyria cutanea tarda. So PCT is actually a really easy one to remember. And the, the reason that it's so easy to remember is that in the name it has cutanea or cutaneous. So you know that this has something to do with the skin. Now the cause here, as I just said, is a uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase dysfunction. The high yield associations mostly have to do with the skin because again, the disease has cutaneous in the name. So you get hyperpigmentation, blistering, and photosensitivity. Those are the big three symptoms. But you also wanna know that this is associated with hepatitis C and that this is worsened by alcohol. Treatment is phlebotomy and low-dose hydroxychloroquine. Of all the diseases, porphyria cutanea tarda is the one that's the, the lowest yield that I think has the least complex and least high yield associations to it. So if you're kind of like figuring out what's important and what you really want to focus on in this video, this can be at the bottom of your list. But I've got great news for you guys. That's it. That's the heme synthesis pathway. It's not as big and scary as all these other resources make it seem like. You don't need a 60 minute long video to explain this. It's a rather straightforward pathway with a few important enzymes and a few important diseases. But if you use my mnemonics and you keep everything stupid and simple, literally that's how I get through my day every single day, keep it stupid, keep it simple. You're gonna understand this whole pathway. You're gonna get 100% of the questions right and I just don't want you guys to be scared. So I hope that this was useful to you. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends. I'm so tired of seeing people waste their medical school loan money on these overpriced clickbait resources. So please get this out there, share this with people that are in dedicated. Again, I hope it was useful. Love you all.